Yeah, welcome to the last section or session of the uh, this uh, meeting. Uh, <clears throat> we now have uh, Professor Don Kurtz. Uh, he, after his PhD in uh, from the University of Texas in 1976, he spent the next 25 years or so, I think, in South Africa, where he's a professor at the uh, University of Cape Town. Then he uh, moved to the UK, to the where he was a professor at the University of Central Lancashire, where he's now an emeritus professor. And he has also kept his affiliation with South Africa as an extraordinary professor at Northwest University, and uh, has also affiliation with the University of Lincoln in the UK. Uh, this year, he has received uh, the, the, the Royal Astronomical Society's uh, Service Award. And now he will tell us about real music from the spheres. <laughs> Thank you, Per. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to start by taking you back 2,500 years <laughs> to Pythagoras, whose name you know well, of course, from the Pythagorean theorem. The Pythagorean Brotherhood and Pythagoras didn't understand the sky, and they believed that the th reason that the planets, the sun, the moon, and the stars moved was that they spun on crystalline spheres, and those crystal spheres hummed and made what we call the music of the spheres. That idea has resonated down two and a half thousand years so that we humans, you've heard it today, we still have the expression, the music of the spheres. The Pythagorean Brotherhood believed only the gods could hear the sound, and humans who were something more than human, super in intellects, and so Pythagoras himself could hear the sound. Uh, he, lived, he lived to a very good age, and now that I'm reaching a very good age myself, I understand that Pythagoras had tinnitus. <laughs> Following Pythagoras, not so long after, Plato said that there's a siren that sits on each planet who carols a most sweet song, agreeing to the motion of her own particular planet, but harmonizing with all the others. 2,000 years later, Johannes Kepler was so enamored with that idea that he spent years trying to fit the motion of the planets into a harmony. And that musical notation that you see up here is from Kepler's own work. One of the things that made him such a great scientist is that after years of work trying to make that function, he gave up, he threw it away, and he went back and discovered his own laws. And of course, a lot of what we've heard about today is based on Newton's form of Kepler's third law. <laughs> the music of the spheres in science died with Kepler. But it's, of course, remained in literature, in art, and you can find everything in Shakespeare. In The Merchant of Venice, when Lorenzo is courting Jessica, the daughter of the merchant, he says to her, there's not the smallest orb which thou beholdest, but in his motion, like an angel sings, still choiring to the young-eyed cherubim. The music of the spheres died in science for 350 years, but starting 50 years ago, it came back and astro-seismology has shown it's really there. We do have music in the stars, you've been hearing about that today, and a dozen years ago now, Connie and Jorn and I finally published the first textbook on this. It's 866 pages, about a kilogram and a half. And, uh, do you know, I perhaps haven't told you to, but I looked this up on Amazon. This is on the Amazon bestseller list. Number 5,347,120. <laughs> Uh, possibly moving up as time goes by. <laughs> now, the book is now a dozen years old, and of course with the space missions, things have been completely changing, and so updates have been coming from many people and many reviews, but you'll find in the reviews of modern physics a very, very thorough review of the theory and application from Connie. You'll find in living reviews from Jorn um, history and current state of the sun and applications of helioseismology to the sun. And then as of last week, there's an annual reviews review of the observational part of astroseismology from me. And this is the three of us couldn't bring ourselves to update the book. <laughs> and so if you would like to follow up further, those are your references. Now, we humans are incredibly visual creatures. We say seeing is believing. As you sit there now looking at me, or looking at the screen, I'd like you to think about what's happening. Let's go back to the neuroscientist we heard just a few days ago. The light is entering your eye, it's being focused on your retina. It's turned into an electrochemical signal that passes down your optic nerve, and you've got a movie theater running in your mind. Me too. 
but other animals can see in other ways. When I was a student in Texas, we did a lot of caving. Texas covered in limestone. You go into a cave and it's full of bats. And they fly around, they don't hit each other, they don't hit you. They get out in the dark and they catch the tiniest little insects by using sound. Now for you and me, sound's very different from vision. And yet as I talk to you, I'm causing your eardrums to vibrate in and out. And that's being turned into an electrochemical signal. Same kind of signal that goes down your optic nerve, but it goes to a different part of your brain. And for, for you and for me, hearing and seeing are very different. You can't get in the mind of another creature. You can't even get in the mind of a human being you know very well. But I'm willing to bet if you could get in the mind of a bat, it's got a movie theater running in its mind. It knows where everything is. You can see with sound. And of course, that's a take-home message for astroseismology. You can see with sound. Of course, you've seen this earlier today, the one-meter Kepler telescope, which orbited the sun well away from the Earth, uh, transformed even beyond the earlier missions, which you love so well, Connie, uh, our entire ability to do astroseismology, and we're currently working with the test mission, a much smaller telescope orbiting the Earth, but covering the entire sky. And so I would like to look at background of astroseismology, some of which you've seen today, but I have a different take and perhaps a different description for you. The fundamental data we need to do astroseismology are the oscillation frequencies in the star identified for their modes, and I'll talk to you in a bit more graphic detail of what those modes look like. The data that we get are time series. They may be velocity time series, like Yvonne's Birmingham Solar Oscillation Network for the Sun, or primarily now, because of Kepler and TESS, they are light curves. And here's an example of a light curve from Kepler. And like you, Yvonne, I've dropped off all the pre-numbers pre on the Julian date, but you can see that's about 100 days out of 1,470 days for each star. And the brightness over here in millimags is parts per thousand. The errors on the data points are, like Jorn was showing you earlier, they're a thousand times smaller than the data point. Everything you see in there is real in terms of the variation. And of course, the Fourier transforms, Erin, you should have talked about Fourier transforms some more. Everybody loves them. <laughs> We just extract the frequencies here, and my job as an observational astroseismologist is to find these frequencies, identify them, characterize them, find the patterns to feed to the theoreticians and the modelers, or to work with them in order to try to build models of the stars and see more astrophysics. So these are the data we get from the missions. These are the data that we work with in terms to do the astroseismology, the frequencies from taking Fourier transforms. So let us have a look at some graphics of what the modes look like. Of course, you've seen this just a moment ago. The radio modes swell and contract spherically symmetrically. The color change represents a temperature change, and that's the primary cause of the light curve. The graphic on the right there just shows you that the radial nodes inside the star, if we're thinking in terms of pressure, are concentric shells where the gas on those shells will be moving like this, but the shells won't be moving. And I've compared that here to an organ pipe. It could have been a clarinet, it could have been a French horn, a musical instrument where one end inside the instrument is a node, but the surface is an antinode, as in this star. And if you looked at the organ pipe, the fundamental to first overtone mode is a half a wave to one and a half waves, and so the period ratio is 0.33. In a Cepheid variable so important for determining the cosmological distance scale, that ratio is 0.7, and that's because the star is centrally condensed and because it has a temperature gradient. The gas does not have the same conditions throughout as in a musical instrument. And as soon as we measure even two modes of oscillation, we've now got a look inside the star. From what I told you about us being visual, I really want you to be thinking this way. We are not just calculating what's happening inside the star. We're not just modeling it. We can see the inside of the star every bit as real as a bat can see a mosquito that is catching in the dark. You really can see into the stars. Now, the structure of the pulsation modes uh, if we take a perfectly spherical star, <laughs> which as you've seen from Connie is not very realistic in many cases, but there are stars out there that are rotating slowly enough and probably weak enough magnetic fields, they're nice and spherical. And the solution to the wave equation, spherical harmonics, there's a clue in the name, the spherical harmonics. You met them, those of you who are physicists in quantum mechanics or electrodynamics, but the nodes were mentioned to you earlier, the number of radial nodes, the number of surface nodes, the number of those nodes that are 
lines of longitude, but let's look at some graphics for this just to get a better picture in your mind. Here is a dipole mode that is zonal, where the equator is a node, and there it is hopping up and down in space. How unphysical. <laughs> How could it just hop up and down like, like geoseismologists don't even think about these things. The Earth doesn't do that. I mean, we've got Newton's laws, right? Well, Jorn Christensen Dalsgaard, when he was a student at Cambridge, showed analytically that stars can oscillate in dipole modes. It's because they're compressible spheres. There's at least one radial node inside, and the center of mass is staying put. And shortly after he did that, I discovered an entire class of stars that oscillate primarily in dipole modes, and we now know they're ubiquitous. Now, if the modes are sectoral, that is, m is not equal to zero, then we end up with these traveling waves, and this is what you were seeing earlier. One of them traveling with the rotation, one against the rotation, and I'll show you how incredibly useful that is and how easy it is to see it in just a moment. One more example, quadrupole mode, if you solve the second Legendre polynomial, you'll find the nodes are approximately, we can do this exactly, at plus or minus 35 degrees latitude, and the equator comes in, the poles stretch, and of course the amplitude is greatly exaggerated, but real stars do this. And then we have the sectoral modes, the tessaral modes going with and against the rotation. So there is the source of our rotational information that Connie was talking to you so much about just a little while ago. This is a movie from a Cray computer, supercomputer calculation of convection in a supergiant. This took two weeks on a Cray, and when they put out the movie, it was two terabytes, and that wouldn't quite fit in my computer. Fortunately, there's a reduced version of it. All they put in was convection, but if you watch this, now this is sped up, this is not real time, but if you watch, you'll see the pulsations in there without even putting in pulsation physics, the convection generates it. And so if you could get up close to one of these pulsating red giants that Yvonne was just talking about, and you could do a bit of time-lapse watching of it, this is the kind of thing that you would see. So how does it work? You've seen these diagrams before, but I'd like to do this once more myself. This is one of Jorn's diagrams. And there is the surface of the star, the center. And the sound waves, as we're talking about sound waves so far, we'll go on to others. Those are the wave fronts, and of course there's a temperature gradient, there's a sound speed gradient, so the deeper into the star the wave is, the faster it's moving, and that causes refraction. And the wave refracts back to the surface, where of course it can't get out into the vacuum, there's nothing to wave, and so it bounces around in its acoustic cavity. And high degree modes will be concentrated near the surface, Lower degree modes go deeper, and you've just seen that before. Jorn showed you how that in the sun, with a couple of million oscillations, you can map out the square of the sound speed to a precision of no worse than, barring the new abundances, of a few parts in a thousand. It's phenomenal. Why do stars have sounds in them? Why do they oscillate? Well, you've heard already for the solar-like oscillators, it's primarily stochastic driving. It's from a wide white noise background. That's mostly being dr driven by convection, and it's not the hot upwelling columns that are doing it primarily. It's those little skinny layers going down between them, which to carry all that mass back down have to go a lot faster. They're turbulent. And the whole, the sun is a very noisy place. You've been in big thunderstorms. Some of you have possibly been in earthquakes. But the Earth's not noisy like the Sun. The Sun is a really noisy place. And of course, that and for the red giants, the solar-like oscillators, the whole star just resonates and starts vibrating. For the rest of the stars, the driving's from a heat engine mechanism, opacity and hydrogen, helium, sometimes iron and nickel. And the important point for you is that when the star compresses, the gases recombine, the opacity goes up, and you gain heat on compression, and that's the recipe for a heat engine. And that's what drives the pulsations in many, many classes of stars. And so let's talk about classes of stars. You've seen a diagram like this earlier. It's an HR diagram, a theoretical one, log temperature versus log luminosity. The main sequence is here, and all these different little ovals represent different classes of pulsating stars. This diagram was first done by Jorn Christensen Dalsgaard. And amusingly, at a meeting in Aarhus once, one of our colleagues from Texas came and put up a diagram like this and said, you know, I really love this diagram. I, Gee, I wish I knew where it came from. <laughs> and he was sitting there talking. It is so widely used now, people have forgotten where it came from. 
And so I will talk to you about only a few of these classes up here. If you'd like to know about all of them, well, then that annual reviews article I just published will give you a complete overview of all the classes. Let's go back to what you've seen for the sun now. This is a Fourier transform of a small piece of the frequency spectrum for the sun from the global oscillations at low frequency instrument on the SOHO mission. The instigation for that instrument came from the original science team, and on the original science team was one Roger Ulrich. Thank you, Roger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the thing that I want you to notice again, you've seen it before, but there's a large separation. Here's the 20th radial overtone and the 21st radial overtone. There's a large separation which depends on the inverse of the sound travel time across the star, call that delta nu naught. It depends on the number of radial nodes, half the number of surface nodes, that's a small constant. And then there's a small separation, which is between the radial and quadrupole mode, or between the dipole and octopole modes, and that depends on the central concentration in the star, hence on the age. This plot comes from a diagram, Bill Chaplin, Yvonne's colleague from Birmingham and his group, a few years ago, showing some amplitude spectra for red giants. And I want you to notice an important thing. You heard earlier about the frequency of maximum power in the sun, which is around 3,000 microhertz or five minutes. And the red giants here, for this star, the frequency of maximum oscillation is around 2,400 microhertz, then 1,900, then 900. These low-frequency stars are the giants. Giants play bass. The sound speed's slower, and it's got farther to travel. These stars are younger, closer to the main sequence. And as Jorn pointed out, and just a moment, Yvonne pointed out too, the frequency of maximum power gives you a measure of mass over radius squared. The large separation gives you the mass over radius cubed, mean density. And the important thing that we're doing with that, other than that we astroseismologists are really interested in the stars, you can get mass and radius in the best cases to a precision of a few percent calibrated against eclipsing binaries. So we know that's right. That's accuracy, not just precision. In general, to 20, 10 to 20%. And it's that that allows you to characterize the radii of the exoplanets because the transits only give you relative ratio of the planet to the star and the mass of the exoplanets, because the radial velocity work from the ground in Newton's form of Kepler's theory law only gives you the mass of the planet if you know the mass of the star. So there's a very important application of the astroseismology. Another important application is determination of stellar age. And so this plot is a plot of the small separation versus the large separation, originator of the plot. You're in Christians and Dalsgar, widely used by other people. This is the main sequence at the top where the hydrogen mass fraction in the core is approximately 70%. And as the star evolves, the hydrogen mass fraction drops, the star becomes more centrally condensed, that changes the small separation, large to, and you can put an age on these stars. What do you use that for? Well, if you're a galactic archaeologist, then you're looking at chemical evolution of the galaxy. If you're somebody working in exoplanets and you find a really nice Earth-like planet around a sun-like star, but it turns out the star is only a couple billion years old, you think, well, maybe this isn't the place to be looking for SETI. Mm -hmm. If it's 10 billion years old or 8 billion years old, mass a little bit smaller than the sun, hey, this may be some place where they've really evolved something beyond us. And so that age is really important with the exoplanet studies too. Now, Roger, this is interesting. I found this only thinking about you for this meeting. Here in 1986, Roger was thinking about determining ages for stars using the seismology um, in this paper. This may be one of the last ones you did when you were still doing seismology. And he's showing how you can use the small separation to get age, but he laments, and I can hear the lament in the last sentence of the abstract, that the frequency resolution needed will require a nearly unbroken time sequence extending for 15 days. And with Kepler, we have 1,470 days. <laughs> and so the lament is long gone. So back to more diagrams from Jorn. The P modes are largely sampling conditions at the surface, although the um, low degree ones penetrate to the core. The G modes are, this is a model for the sun here, hence the G modes stop at the con convection zone. The G modes, we call them gravity modes. Buoyancy is the restoring force. And of course, convection is runaway buoyancy. 
So there is no standing wave solution for buoyancy inside of a convection zone. You don't have any standing G-modes in the outer convection zone, something like the sun, or in the inner convection zone of the very hot stars that other people are interested in. Some astronomers, helio, he, solar astronomers, claim to have found G-modes in the sun. Those claims have been coming for decades now. They believe it. Unfortunately, almost all of their colleagues don't, and this has been going on for a long time. Because in order to see G-modes in the sun, the entire outer layer has to be lifted up on these internal G-modes, which would produce a very tiny signal. But why do you want them? Because they're sampling the conditions right down in the very core, where you might be interested in the nuclear energy, nuclear energy generation, the core conditions. That's a really interesting place to see. G-modes probe core convection in the boundary conditions. I'll show you that in the next slide. And core overshoot. I'll leave explaining core overshoot until the next slide. One of Connie's specialties. Interior rotation, of course, you've been hearing about that earlier. This is really new that we can do it. Core magnetic fields is really, really new, just coming. And so they're important for determining angular momentum transport, lifetimes of star stars, core fuel supply, and magnetic field structure and how that evolves. Here's a plot, very recent paper by Mike Peterson, and perhaps some other names that you might recognize on there, with a little cartoon that I've put up. And there's the inner convection zone in a massive star. Of course, if you do the Schwarzschild criterion for convection, up comes a rising bubble of gas, and then we hit the point where it's no longer driven to rise, and we draw that as the edge of the convection zone. But of course, the bubbles coming from below when they get to that point may not still be being pushed, but they coast. They've got velocity. They coast beyond it. And so at some point beyond the edge of the zone, which we calculate from the Schwarzschild criterion, there will be penetration farther out, and these are various models trying to model how that penetration may go, but it dredges down unprocessed material, giving more nuclear fuel to the core and extending the star's lifetime. And so it's important for determining stellar lifetimes. There's another version of a plot you've seen a couple times today. <clears throat> this one from Sylvain Korzenik at Harvard University, showing the interior rotation of the sun. When I was a student, undergraduate student even more than 50 years ago, being taught about the rotation of the sun. The model for the rotation was that the sun would rotate on cylinders. That's what was believed then. It was thought that at every point, here's the, here's the rotation axis, at every distance from the rotation axis, we'd have constant rotation. This should be blue all the way down and yellow all the way down, according to the old models. Without helioseismology, <clears throat> we never would have been able to test this. I like to think of the interior of the sun quite differently now that we've got these plots. I like to think of the sun as rotating with a period of 27 days. You've been told that that's uh, essentially rigid rotation below the convection zone. So the sun rotates in 27 days with tremendous winds blowing to the east at the equator and tremendous winds blowing to the west up at the pole. We're you know, not normally thinking of winds in the sun, but boy, that you can think of those as really big winds and we can see them. Well, I want to show you the inside of a star, or at least how we determine the rotation, in a really simple case. Now, Connie showed you some, uh, but her cases were more complicated, because she was showing you slopes and plots of G-modes. I'm just going to show you some straight G-modes where right in the face, if you're an astroseismologist and you're doing pattern recognition in a Fourier transform, the rotation just hits you in the face. There it is. You can just see it. This star has got a very romantic name, Kepler Input Catalog, 1114, 5123. If you like numbers like I do, that's very memorable. <laughs> and in this plot in the Fourier transform, we're working in cycles per day. You've seen those earlier today. They're convenient for this. The G modes are down around one or two cycles per day, so 12 hours to 24 hours. And the P modes are up 12 to 24 cycles per day, so one hour to two hours. You can immediately relate that diagram to the time scale for the star. And here's a close-up of the G-mode region. There is a whole series of G-modes there, and you can look at the period separations and do those tilt plots for them. But what you're looking at here is a G-mode with L equals 1, M equals plus 1, 0, and minus 1. And when I say 0, there is 1 in the middle. This can be deconstructed. You can't see it until you deconstruct it. There are the three dipole modes. And that one's going with rotation, this one's going against, and the separation between those two is the rotation in the core of the star. 
with no model dependency. Reason for that, well, here's, here's what they look like again graphically. Those three peaks, you, well, the two peaks you just saw and the one hiding in the middle are this one, that's the one hiding in the middle, and this one. The one hiding in the middle you can't see because it's essentially in, in this orientation. And everything that's happening up here is being canceled by what's happening down there. If you could look pole on, you would see the one in the middle. So there's the frequency of one of those modes. It depends on the rotation frequency and how the star is sensitive to the pulsation mode. That's called the kernel. And you saw some diagrams earlier representing that. I'll show you a slightly different one in a moment. And it depends on the Ledoux constant. Ledoux was Paul Ledoux, the very, very famous uh, Belgian theoretician who was one of the very founders of our entire field um, back in the 1940s, 50s, even in the 40s. And so that's called the Ledoux constant. But the important thing about it is, is that for these high overtone G modes with many, many, many radial nodes, Asymptotically, that number just approaches 0.5. And you don't actually have to do any models at all. And so the separation between those two outer frequencies is the rotation deep in the core of the star. And it's, you can see the precision, it's 105 days. That's why this star is so easy and why we could see it. It's a very slow rotator. Fast rotation complicates this problem. You saw earlier in Connie's talk how to deal with those complications, but here you can just see it. So there's the core rotation, 105 days. At the surface of the star, we've got a P-mode triplet, dipole. Uh, I put this as a P-mode quintuplet. This is actually a mixed mode and has some G-mode sensitivity to the core. And here's what the kernels look like for those three modes. This is now the sensitivity of the star, the interior to the mode. This is the fractional radius. There's the center of the star. Here's its surface. This blank area right here is the inner convection zone. There are no standing waves in that convection zone, although there may be inertial waves in there that can couple. And the G mode is very sensitive to the conditions just outside the core. We looked at that was 105 days for the rotation of the star. The P mode and the mixed mode are mostly sensitive to the outer conditions. And so if I look at the P mode splitting, now the Ledoux constant matters, but for the P modes it's very near to zero. And for our argument right now, we can just take it to be zero. Again, we're not model dependent. We don't need any models of the star to look at this. We find the rotation of the surface of the star 98 and a half days. The surface is rotating faster than the core. This is in your face, non-model dependent rotation of the surface and the inside of the star. Who ordered that? The star is evolving. The core is shrinking. It's spinning faster. The outside's swelling up. It's spinning more slowly and yet the surface of the star is spinning faster than the core. Connie earlier was talking about where's all the angular momentum gone in the core of the red giants? They're rotating 10 times faster than the surface, not 1,000 times faster though. How does it get transported? And that is an entirely new booming field of studies theoretically inside of stars, is how to transport the angular momentum, how does that affect the evolution of the stars? Uh, internal gravity waves is one of the main ideas. And if you'd like to read about all this in some detail, um, Connie has reviewed it recently. I'll show you the review in just a moment. We've also got another kind of oscillation that you haven't been told about yet today that we're beginning to exploit in these stars. This is a paper that Hideyuki Sayo and I and others did recently uh, on Rossby waves, torsional waves on the surfaces of stars. Um, they're restored by the Coriolis force, very sensitive to rotation, and they're hard to see, but where you can see them, you've now got a measure of surface rotation in cases where there are no P modes. You could have G modes and Rossby modes, and now you've got surface to core rotation again. And they look quite different to what you've seen before. Here's some graphic representations of what a couple of those Rossby waves look like from Hideyuki Sayo, from that paper I just showed you. They're torsional, they could be like this in the simplest case, and very sensitive to surface rotation. So here we have another way to measure surface rotation and compare with the G modes in the core. And there's where to go if you would like to know all about this. 2019 Annual Reviews of Astronomy Astrophysics, Connie Arts, Stefan Matisse, Tammy Rogers. Mm, I think that's why Connie wasn't here on Monday, because of this group of three. Is that right? Nah, two of the three. Two of the three, okay. Two others. And two others. This is a U.S. Science Magazine. Senna, if you're still here, this is a journalist from this magazine just called me up and wanted to, wanted to talk about weird stars, because I work on weird stars. And so we talked about them. Kepler's 
found the weird and the wonderful. I have an entire box on my computer sitting over there of stars that are labeled, what is it? <laughs> Lots of them. What fun. What is it? We don't know yet. But let me show you some that we do know. Now, there's a nice diagram from Jennifer Johnson, Ohio State University, who's an expert on the origin of the elements. And that nice periodic table shows you hydrogen from the Big Bang, helium mostly from the Big Bang, but where all the elements come from in terms of supernova explosions, mass loss in terms of producing planetary nebulae, uh, colliding neutron stars, producing gravitational waves, and also making heavy elements. And the reason I put this up is that one of the groups of stars I like best because I discovered them are the weirdest stars in the sky. They're called peculiar stars for good reason, because when you look at the spectrum of these stars, yeah, you can see the hydrogens there, but it isn't what really grabs you. What grabs you is the lanthanum, cerium, presidymium, neodymium, samarium, europium, gadolinium, terbium, dysprosium. Do you feel I should have Tom Lehrer here singing this for me? <laughs> Sometimes a million times more abundant than the sun. They're called peculiar A stars, and more than 40 years ago, I discovered they oscillate with very high frequencies, and they've got a several characteristics that are important for lots in astroseismology. One is, they're very strongly magnetic. Magnetic fields interact with pulsation. You've been told earlier today, we're beginning to see that in the core. We can see the interaction of P-modes in the sun with sunspots. Sunspots retard the motion of a P-mode through it. Sunspots di diffract modes down into the sun. But other than in the sun, where do you study the interaction of pulsation and strong magnetic fields? These stars have got magnetic fields up to tens, tens of kilogauss at the surface. And so you can look at the way the magnetic field interacts with the pulsation. The magnetic field also is so strong that it governs the pulsation strong, more strongly than the rotation. And so the pulsation axis is tipped to the rotation axis. And these stars are what are called oblique pulsators. I developed the model for that. And then I thought 40 years ago when I developed that model, you know, if you get a couple of stars that are really close together that are tidally distorted, they should pulsate along the tidal axis. I tried for decades to find them and couldn't. Until now, I'll come back to it. The other thing that's important in these stars is that they're peculiar because of atomic diffusion. And atomic diffusion is now important in all stellar models. Yorn's even got some of it in Model S, at least in terms of settling. And so in these stars, radiation pressure has levitated the rare Earths, which have got lots of absorption lines near flux maximum, and they're actually floating in cirrus clouds at the top of the atmosphere. They can be up optical depth 10 to the minus 5 in terms of continuum. And these cirrus clouds are floating at different levels, and you can now see the star in three dimensions. But importantly, this diffusion that you would like to include in all your stellar models is most easily seen and tested in these peculiar stars. This star was called Kepler Object of Interest 54. Most Kepler Objects of Interest were potential planets, but the weird stars got those names too, passed on to uh, those of us who work in astroseismology. And so this is now a little more than 10 years ago, and you'll see in this, this is uh, six months worth of data, and this star goes blip, blip, blip every 42 days. And we looked at that and said, what is that? <laughs> Where did that come from? If you fold it on the 42 days, it also oscillates. And the oscillations are always in the same place with respect to the blip. We called it a heartbeat star because it looks like an electrocardiogram. It was very easy to figure out what they were doing. They do have potential applications, but they're quaint. So here's an animation from Jim Fuller. Jim is our theoretician for this, who's at Caltech. And the two stars are just in an incredibly highly eccentric binary. And we could just call them highly eccentric binaries. When they go through periastrin passage, they're only a couple stellar radii apart. And that stretches them out of shape, and that's what produces the blip. And of course, it sets them to oscillating. And so now we have oscillations interacting with stellar tides. And tides, the exchange of angular momentum, rotational energy between rotation, orbit, pulsation, is important for the evolution of binary stars. And these stars begin to test that. Well, all right, somebody else was thinking about it 20 years ago. <laughs> Good thing you're old enough to have it 20 years ago, Connie. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to also point out, for those heartbeat stars, I had an undergraduate student take first-year astronomy with me, Kelly Hamilton. She's now a faculty member at Villanova University. And four years later, when she started her PhD, she did her, she did her PhD on heartbeat stars but they didn't exist when she took first-year astronomy just four years before. Our students are getting to work on projects that 
they've only just come out the last year. You're used to that too. The last year or two. It's just fantastic opportunities. And so the title astroseismology, what are we finding out? We finally found the stars that are pulsating along the tidal axis that I thought I'd like to find 40 years ago but never did. Now with the test mission data, they're coming out. Um, we're calling them tidally trapped or tidally tilted pulsators. There's the first one from a um, Nature Astronomy article recently. And then here was the first one we called a single-sided pulsator. Only one side of the star pulsates, not the whole thing globally, approximately. And so here's a little graphic to try to illustrate that. First of all, these are in close binaries. And so, of course, the companion has distorted the star. This is no longer simple spherical stars where you can just apply a spherical harmonic. And where the lower density is here, and the temperature gradient is different, in this particular star, close to the L1 point, everybody's familiar with Lagrangian points nowadays. Everybody loves L2, of course. But the L1, L3, L4, and L5 are out there. And this particular star has its oscillation concentrated at L1. And you, if you look carefully, the oscillation is just here. And the rest of the star is pretty much not participating in that. Where's the proof? All right, here, back to the light curves. So here's the light curve of that star. You can see days here, three, six. This is a very short time. The period's only a little over a day. And the main variation you see right here is just the change in cross-section. When you see the star side on, it's bigger. That makes it brighter. When it comes around end on, you've got a lower cross-section. It's dimmer, and that's just called an ellipsoidal variable. And there's the rotational orbital variation. And when I remove that, there are the pulsations, and you can see the stars pulsating when the L1 point's pointed towards the observer. And when the L3 points towards the observer, you're looking at the other side, the oscillations just go away. And so here's a new opportunity to look at the interaction of pulsation, orbital motion, and rotation. Back to that pulsation HR diagram. There are so many things in here that I could tell you about, but I'm going to end in terms of the stars with just the end state of most stars. 97% of all stars end up as white dwarfs. We've been doing astroseismology of white dwarfs for many decades. We love them because they're so odd. And I think most of you know yourselves, but for those of you who don't, when a sun-like star evolves, it fuses hydrogen to helium, grows to be a red giant, fuses helium to carbon, and a little bit of the helium and carbon to oxygen. That collapses until it's degenerate. The outer atmosphere is blown away, and there is your remnant white dwarf with a carbon-oxygen core, primarily carbon. And as that cools with time, the nuclei settle into potential wells. They crystallize into a contaminated diamond about the size of the Earth. Science fiction, just a weird idea, or Jane Taylor's little poem, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. No, it's for real. With the astroseismology, we can actually see that the core of the stars crystallized because that changes what we see in the surface pulsations. And so there's a, a rather fanciful, but at least gives you the idea, shot from something Travis Metcalf had made up when he was working at Harvard on one of these white dwarfs where we were able to show that the core is crystallized. There really are diamonds up there the size of the Earth. Well, Yvonne introduced you to Arthur Eddington's beginning to his book, The Internal Constitution. The picture of the book up there is the picture from my copy. I bought it in the 1960s when I was an undergraduate, still sitting on my desk. It was only then 40 years old. I've had it for longer than it was old at that time. And so in that first paragraph, when he asked what appliance can pierce through the outer layers of a star and test the conditions within, you now know that the answer to that is astroseismology. I would like to diverge just slightly right now and talk about a topic dear to my heart, and I think to all of yours too, and to this particular week. We often hear from politicians, from grant panels, the question, you know, what's the impact of your work? Where's it going? Or from the Minister of Science at the banquet the other night, can you solve problems for me? How can I make money out of this? And there's a person who I thought put this extremely well, He's an Australian by the name of Howard Florey. Many of you may not know his name, but Florey, Ernst Chain, and Alexander Fleming got the 1945 Nobel Prize in Medicine. In Fleming's case for discovering penicillin, in Florey's case for bringing penicillin into medical use. And when he was asked about this, he responded, people sometimes think that I and the others worked on penicillin because we were interested in suffering humanity. 
I don't think it ever crossed our minds about suffering humanity. This was an interesting scientific exercise, and because it was of some use in medicine, is very gratifying, but this is not the reason we started to work on it. Talk about impact. How many hundreds of millions of people's lives have been saved by this man's work? Who wasn't interested in whether they were living or dying, he was interested in the problem. My own grandmother died when she was 25 years old of a disease that antibiotics would have saved her and she'd had a whole life. That's impact. And yet, he was doing blue skies research. And of course, the other man that we know extremely well from this week is Fred Cavley. And that's Cavley's vision too, that the long-term benefit of blue skies research will come out in the long run. And let me finish by just talking about what that is for stars. We have been studying stars, looking up at the sky, wondering about them for millennia. For the last 400 years, if we perhaps go back to Copernicus and work our ways forward, we're trying to figure out what makes the stars shine. And we now know the answer to that. And we know how to do it. And at the moment, with ITER and Catarash, with the National Ignition Facility in the US, and with multiple other small industrial applications coming, the engineers will solve the problem of controlled hydrogen fusion. And hydrogen fusion will be the energy source primarily for humans forever after once that's solved. Low pollution, lots of energy. That's the biggest economic payoff possible. Everything comes down to being able to do work and having energy. That's from studying the stars. If we looked at Jennifer Johnson's diagram, except for the hydrogen in your water, all of the elements in this room, in us, the biology, have come from stars. And the understanding of the stars is relevant to that original question, where do we come from? How did we get here? How did the universe get like this? If we watch the stars and just watch the moon with Doppler shift, Newton's form of Kepler's third law, well, we can help Andy, we can help Aaron, because that's how we get the masses for those black holes. I mean, it's not the disks that give us that, but just watching the stars go around in the center of the galaxy gives you the mass of the central black hole. Watching the galaxy rotate, watching clusters of galaxies where the light's coming from the stars, the stars are the luminous tracers of the whole universe. And that, of course, is what's led us to think that the universe is mostly dark matter and dark energy. What a puzzle. We need to understand the stars to do problems like that. And of course, one of the deepest questions we humans can ask is, are we alone? Is this the only planet in the universe that's got life? And the stars are the powerhouse that make Earth livable and make other exoplanets, we hope, livable. And I'm hoping that even within the next decade, lifetimes of everybody in this room, I hope, we're gonna get some news report that at least we found bacterial life on nearby planets Understanding the stars is an important part of that. And that was Fred Cavley's vision of just understanding basic things about the universe and let the applications come. Thanks for your attention this afternoon.